This is Behind the Mic with Brad Dalius. Behind the Mic is off and running on this Thursday evening, April the 26th, 2018, from King's Cove inside the Toyota Sports Center here in El Segundo, just off of Nash Street. Brad Dallas and Keith Jackson hanging out on this busy NFL draft evening. We have a lot to get to tonight. BehindTheMicShow.com and the Behind the Mic app is your ways to listen to the program tonight. Great show for you. As I said, lots of NFL draft talk. The Rams haven't picked yet. They won't do so in round three, but the Chargers did. We'll tell you who they selected in just a sec. We're going to speak tonight with Jerry Porter, former receiver for the Oakland Raiders. Great career for him. We're going to get his thoughts on the draft tonight and uh, maybe how things turned out for him on draft night a long time ago, Keith, as well. So we're excited to talk with Jerry later on tonight. We have to get into the NBA. One game going on in the playoffs tonight. That is the Milwaukee Bucks trying to force a Game 7 against the Boston Celtics as those two, those two battled out right now in Milwaukee. Baseball, Angels, and Dodgers are both off this evening. Those two looking to rest up before getting going this weekend. Uh, big series for the Angels. you got the Yankees coming into town down in Anaheim, and uh, the Dodgers will be busy as well. So... Like I said, NFL draft, that's the biggest thing that's going on right now. We'll get to it in just a sec. Keith, what's going on? How are things? Things are great. You know, and following the draft, following some NBA basketball. And, um, you know, it's, it's a really important time of year for these NBA, for these NFL teams right now um, and making their decisions. And, you know, either they get an A or they get a fail. And,. <laughs> um, some of them we looked at, they got a fail, and some of them we looked at, seeing draft, and got an A plus. So, um, you know, it's been it's, it's great time to be watching sports, and you know, and also you can see a lot of hockey going on around here, and and uh, so you know, playoffs are still going on. This is playoffs time, so this is a great time of the year for sports in general. Pittsburgh beat Washington three to two. Keith was referencing the NHL totally playoffs. Nice. Penguins up one game to none. San Jose and Vegas just about to drop the puck from the T-Mobile Arena. We'll see if the Golden Knights can continue their hot ways here against San Jose. It's been like forever since they played a game. They swept away the Kings yeah. so quick. I just looked at it. I was like, wow. And they really do. The Golden Knights, their pregame or they're coming out, they really do put on a show. I mean, I know it's Vegas, but I'm just looking at it. I was like, what is it, like medieval times or something going on over there? Hey, their play on the ice this year has just been half the fun for yeah, their fans. Exactly. Well, You're right. What a way to kick it off here. I know. This is going to be a good game. But you know what? You know, it's it, I, I, I'm still a West, West Coast guy, so I got to go with the Golden Knights. I'm going to root for them, and hopefully they can make it to the Stanley Cup. That would be a great story if they can get all the way to the Stanley Club. But they got to get through San Jose Sharks first. San Jose is also a California. They're a Nor- NorCal team. So, you know, what a battle right here. It's going to be a great time. So we'll Yeah, see. I'm with you, Keith. I want to see this Cinderella run continue yep. of year one for this uh, expansion franchise team. Uh, like you said, I mean, what a story it would be if they can go all the way and uh, maybe they play Pittsburgh in the final and you get the, the two goalies who used to be teammates. Who knows? Lots of great storylines as those two uh, teams get ready to, as I said, drop the puck there. Game one in Vegas, Knights and Sharks. I got to say, NFL draft right off the bat, I'm tired of the booing of Roger Goodell. Come on. (laughs) We get it. People boo commissioners across all sports. They've done that for a long time now. But I want to hear him announce the draft pick, Keith. For It doesn't matter which team. I want to hear it. I want to hear the little entertainment they have in between. They had a nice little introduction 
with uh, Goodell when he came out with a couple of uh, former Dallas Cowboys and current Dallas Cowboy and Jason Witten. All I heard was the bull, the uh, booze raining down. Yeah. Come on, it's a little bit too much at this point. Yeah, it is. You can cut it back. We get it. Yeah, we get it. I mean, we, we do, and they're going to always boo the commissioner. I don't know what that's about. You know, um, only thing I can think about is the Tom the Tom Brady incident and, the you know, the Patriots booing him. But other than that, like, I'm like, man, okay. Most every commission, teams, though, most teams, most teams are going to cheer him for yeah, what he did with the yeah, Patriots yeah. situation. So but I, it's just, to me, it is. It's just like, okay, boo the commissioner. And for him, he's like, okay, fine, whatever. He's over it, you know. But I don't know what that's about, you know. So hopefully, you know, next season they don't boo the commissioner. Just let them, let's let's hear the let's hear the the selections. That's what we want to hear. So I don't know. I, I I feel indifferent about it too. So we'll see. As for the picks, as I mentioned, the Chargers just selected the safety out of Florida State, Derwin James. We mentioned him last night on our mock drafts. We did yeah. not think he would fall this far down to 17 in the Chargers' laps. Great pickup for them. That is a great pickup. They're getting better on the defensive end. Uh, of the ball, and I think that's where it starts. I think they're taking a the page out the Rams and trying to get better on the defensive end. And, um, you know, they got a great safety, a young safety who can fly to the ball, who can lay vicious hits, and he's big, he's big for his position. So I, I agree with it. I like the pick that they, they picked up. I think that they got a, a diamond in the rough right there. We heard the reports earlier today the Browns seemingly fell in love with Baker Mayfield. They epic made it official. Fail. They and selected him number one overall. Epic fail on their part. You know, I when I saw her, when you actually get, called me on the phone, I was driving here, and you called me and said, did you hear Cleveland? Did you hear what Cleveland picked? I said, unbelievable. I mean, how do you feel, how do you feel that, I'm sorry, you should have went for Saquon Barkley. The quarterbacks were going to be there. They were going to be there. Like you have, there's four great quarterbacks in this draft, right? Josh Allen, Josh Rosen, uh, Baker Mayfield, and um, Sam Darnold, right? And uh, oh yeah, there's a Lamar Jackson out there. So there's five great quarterbacks. You're going to get one of them. Baker Mayfield would have been there in a the fourth pick. He would, I think he would have been there in a the fourth pick. The, he absolutely would have been there. The best running back in the draft. You need a great running back. What what, are we, what is Baker Mayfield going to do for you? Tyrod Taylor, they're going to roll with that guy all the way to the end unless he gets hurt. So you're not going to really get much from Baker Mayfield. I mean, look, you, he just he was going to be there in the second. He was going to be there in the fourth pick. Come on. He would have been there in the fourth pick. Saquon Barkley, immediately, the Giants didn't even run that out, that timeout. They knew exactly. I was like, oh, Baker, Saquon Barkley. They knew exactly what they were going to get. I was a slam dunk for them. Was just, that was a, hey, Giants did a great job. They needed a running back. We have said that many times. They had not had a running back since Brandon Jacobs. Let's, yeah. just be, let's just be honest. They haven't had a running back since Brandon Jacobs. They got a great player, Saquon Barkley, who reminds me of a little bit of Ray Rice. Yeah. The way he is. A little bigger, but yeah, a little comparable. bigger, but but go to Ray Rice. And that's just a great that's a great pickup for them. And then I think they I hope they go out and get a line now that's gonna be able to open those holes up for him so he's able to run and he's not be able to stuff he won't get stuffed every time. But I mean that what an epic fail from Cleveland Browns. I mean, and then the four pick you pick a cornerback? You pick Derwin James. Look, I'm not knocking Derwin James. Okay, fine, he's a great player. But he's not a fourth pick. Denzel Ward. Denzel Ward, I'm sorry. Ohio State, yeah. Denzel Ward. We know what you meant. Yeah, you select Denzel Ward from Ohio State in the fourth so, uh, fourth selection? That That's not – I don't know. Look, this is the result of a new GM and John Dorsey, who is brand new to Cleveland, but he feels tremendous pressure, Keith, to get the quarterback pick correct. That's why I, I believed all along they would take a quarterback – Although we've been beating the drum, they should have took Barkley, best player available in the draft. They passed on him. I think they're going to regret it. But they take a quarterback, and they take a big swing on Baker Mayfield. To me, extremely high risk, extremely high reward potential. I look at it this way. Baker Mayfield, he's either going to have a phenomenal NFL career or he's going to be a colossal bust. Yeah. One or the other. To me, you, you need to get a guy that's going to help you immediately. 
Colts going to win immediately. Well, that's the problem, though, Keith. None of these quarterbacks can do that for no, you. No, absolutely not. That's why, like you're saying, you should they should have took Barkley. Saquon Barkley is going to help you immediately. That's an immediate. That's an immediate go right there. That's what's going to help you right away. You got Jarvis Landry on one side. You're going to ha- oh, you're going to have the return of um, help me out, Josh Gordon. Josh Gordon, yeah, he'll be back. The return of Josh Gordon. And then you got Saquon. You can have Saquon Barkley in the backfield. What are you thinking? I don't know, man. That that was just that was a. a I don't like the move. I don't know if you Cleveland Brown fans like the move. I would love to hear from somebody tonight about this. 213-261-7491. 213-261-7491. I look at it this way again. Baker Mayfield was their guy at the end of the day. They fell in love with him at some part here recently. Reports came out as early as the beginning of this week that they were looking at him, giving him heavy consideration. They, I think Dorsey really feared that if they would have passed on him at one, the Jets would have took him at three. Because the Jets also, I think, had a strong inkling they wanted to go with Baker Mayfield as well. I think Dorsey, again, tremendous were, pressure it, to get the quarterback position right in Cleveland, and sometimes pressure can do you to, can cause you to do some things you don't necessarily want to do. Mm-hmm. But so ba- he takes a big swing here. Yeah, I, I guess he does. I think I think the Jets really. I think the Jets just played mind games with them because the Jets been endorsing Sam Darnold when he was even at when he was playing over here at USC. You know they've been endorsing Sam Darnold from the ju- from the jump. So you know I-, I think they just just basically toyed with with uh, Cleveland's head, saying, hey, "We want Baker Mayfield because they knew that that's somebody they were interested in." Now but in it's... reality, they would have selected Sam Darnold, right? And they're the same. Sam Darnold and Baker Mayfield are the exact same players. Just Sam Darnold's a little bigger. That's to me. Oh, I disagree. Sam Darnold runs the. He runs just like Baker Mayfield. He runs. He can run out the pocket. Sam Darnold. Uh, he doesn't sit in the pocket. He doesn't. Uh, Sam Darnold can sit in the pocket just like Baker Mayfield, and he runs out the pocket just like Baker Mayfield. He's Baker not, Mayfield Baker's was probably not as accurate as, as just an accurate as throw. He, Baker Mayfield probably makes better decisions than him. In terms oh, he definitely of, does. Makes better decisions, but. Other than that, I mean... Oh, I think he makes better decisions. I think he's more accurate, too. At least this past season proved it. The biggest problem with Sam Darnold was, especially if you look at some of the tape, end of the season against UCLA, against Ohio State in the Cotton Bowl, one of his biggest problems was on third down against the pressure. He panicked a little bit, turned the ball over, took a couple sacks. That's my biggest concern with him translating over to the National Football League when you have third down defensive coordinators... They get exotic. They can come up with these crazy schemes to really confuse you at quarterback, especially a young rookie quarterback. That's why I worry about him and his ability to translate over from college to the NFL, especially on third down, the money down, as we all know, in the NFL on Sundays. Big difference. Baker Mayfield actually was a lot more accurate and protected the football a lot more than Sam Darnold. My biggest knock on Baker Mayfield is, is the height. And if that type of game can translate over, to the NFL. He's not Johnny Manziel. I think those comparisons have been a little unfair to Baker Mayfield. But at the same time, he's a long-term project. Yeah. A lot of potential there, but it's a big risk, especially when you have the best player in the draft like Saquon Barkley, a type of back we may not see for a very, very long time again come through. To pass on him, mm, that, that just that's a tough one to live with for me. Yeah. Just analyzing this draft as we have now for several weeks and, and watching these players' careers, whether it be at USC, Barkley's, uh, in his case, at Penn State, it's really tough. Now, it's interesting with the Giants. They take Barkley, can't blame him. Great guy to take at that spot. However, now a lot of pressure on Eli Manning. Yeah. And it tells me that they are committed to winning in 2018 and 2019, which I, I don't think they're ready to do. I don't think Barkley is the is the cure all for them no. to become a winning team and to make the playoffs. My concern is that they're buying into that he's the type of player who can take them over the top. He's not going to be able to do it by himself. A lot of pressure on Eli Manning here, and uh, you know Davis Webb is behind Eli Manning. I still don't think he's the answer long term for them. So they don't get their quarterback. It, it, it's a bit of a trade off here for the Giants. That's how I look at it. Can't blame them for taking Barkley. However, they still have big question marks long-term at the quarterback position. 
Yeah, I, I have to agree with you on that. I think they, but I think there's other holes that really they need to fill before the quarterback, because Eli's going to be there for a couple more years. So maybe we don't the, know that Eli's got at least three years left. You think so? Yeah. I don't. I don't know. I don't know if he's got three years. Three years left. Eli got three years left. They need to get better, and they and his career will go longer if they get a better line. That's the problem. The problem was. Last year, they didn't go out and get an O-line. They stayed with the O-line they had the previous year before that. And they everyone is saying, you have to get better in the offensive line. And they didn't. They didn't get any, anything better in the O-line, and they didn't do anything with the running back position. This year, they improved by going getting a stud running back, which was great. But I was, you know, they got these couple more rounds. I would get better. I would get bigger at that left and right tackle offensive line. That's what I would do. I would get bigger if I was them at the line to protect Eli. Is going to last. I mean, you you got you got your receivers. Obviously, you're going to stay with Odell. You know, uh, you got Sterling Shepard out there still, and they just cut Brandon Marshall, so they don't have him. And then there's a Des Bryant still out there, and the people don't know where he's going yet. He just turned down the Ravens deal. So, did the Golden Knights just score? They just oh. scored. Man. One nothing. Very reminiscent. Of their game one goal against the Kings, Kings where yeah. they scored like a couple minutes into the game. Same yeah. thing looks like it happened no, right the here. the Kings, they scored in like nine seconds. And, and they that, scored that in like, like a nine seconds. Time. It felt that way, right? <laughs> I was like, was it nine seconds and the Kings just got scored? <laughs> I was crazy. Yeah, they scored. In the blink of an eye. Yeah, so. That's what they did here. That's what they've been doing all season long, seemingly, and into these playoffs for sure. The first couple rounds there, they just strike first. Yeah. While the iron is hot and, and draw first blood and. Yeah, you can just get crazy momentum going from there. You know, I was worried about the Golden Knights because they've been sitting out for so long. I know. We mentioned that last night. And then all of a sudden, you see them just just picking up where they left off. But back to football, you know, um, you got right now you have the Detroit Lions on a Clark. Lamar Jackson still there. I bet you your bottom dollar. For some reason, I think the uh, Detroit Lions are going to set Lamar Jackson. They scored... Did the Golden Knights just score it again? Man, that horn there in Vegas is going to get worn out, Keith. I mean, that goal horn. Woo. You see how fast? I, what was that like? Gotta, I, hope, I hope people out there are watching this game. Is it like 10 seconds? It, this may be, a, ba- this may be a, ba- a football score at the end of this. Just, I mean, they are scoring so fast. That was look How? 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 How do you score that fast? Off a turnover? That's an immediate turnover. That's just impressive to me. I mean, that, if you don't come ready to bring your A game against them right from the jump again, yeah. you could be in a hole like they are right now. Yeah. And, is, and the way that uh, Mark Andre Fleury's been playing, it's hard to get uh, goals yeah. past them. Yeah. So, so once I'm, again, red hot. Yeah. The but, Vegas but, Knights. Oh, you see that going on, but look, watch. Detroit Lions back to football. Go, to, yeah. go, go ahead and select Lamar Jackson. Lamar Jackson. Yeah. Somebody's gonna get Lamar Jackson before I, I can see it. You got the you got Bengals who what? They need a quarter. They have Andy Dalton, but they don't have a great backup quarterback. Ravens, Joe Flacco, who likes to run and they get to get some more speed out there and get use a running uh, quarterback. And then you have the and then you have the Patriots right there who's been high on them before. So I I'm think, a little uh, surprised he's falling, Keith, just because of his stock has gone yeah. up in recent days and weeks. But you have other teams here, as you see, especially like 10 to 20, a lot of defensive needs. Yeah. A lot of defensive. So those guys are coming off the board. Jackson is still there. Mason Rudolph is still on the board as well, the quarterback out of Oklahoma State. Uh-huh. So, I, yeah, I, is there any question at this point that New England is going quarterback? With this yeah, pick right now, they need to go quarterback. I, I really, I mean, I'll be shocked if they go something else in that position. However, they did lose a great offensive lineman. I can see them going O lines as well. With losing Nate Solder, yeah, yeah, I, I can see them going O line as well. Um, and then, I mean, possibly receive. I mean, I just can't see them sticking with with. I can see them either going another tight end or something like that because they you don't need know, depth there. Because of Gronkowski, yep. uh, you know, his situation, or whatever he's bugging out. He, they said he's coming back now, or and everything like that. That's what's been reported. He made it official on Instagram that he is on coming Tuesday. back. Yes. That he's coming back to the Patriots. You know, um, but uh, Brady has he made it official yet? 
I don't think he's made it official. But everybody His agent, is. Don Yee, came out earlier this week and said he fully expects him to play. Uh-huh. But I don't think Brady himself has made any type of social media post or a formal announcement uh-huh. via the public that he's coming back. Oh, my gosh. They scored again. A trifecta here within the first couple minutes in Vegas. Turn on the Golden Knights San Jose Sharks game right now if you're at home. If you're on your way home and you're pulling up, you need to turn on to this game now. There may be set a record. It is now 3-0 to zero, Golden Knights against the San Jose Sharks. It was in the first six minutes. <laughs> this is unbelievable. Well, there goes the theory about them, uh, you know, being a little rusty with all the rest. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that San, went out the window. Hey, San Jose's ready to go home now. <laughs> this is going to be a long night for San Jose Sharks. Team of destiny. This is I, I think they are destined maybe to, to hoist the cup oh, in yeah. year one. If, if they do, this is going to be something remarkable to say. I know a few people over there in Vegas who are just going crazy right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know who you're talking about. I know you do. <laughs> <laughs> so... But wow, what a game! And we, and, and uh, you know, so ba- so we got, so we was wrong. Uh, Detroit went ahead and they got a center. Okay, Frank Ragnall. You know, I think that's a good pick. I mean, it's decent. You got, you know, I can take that. But yeah, you know, look, first year with Patricia, as we all know, coming over as head coach, you want to build it inside out, right? Yeah. You want to get the guys up front on the O-line and D-line and, and sometimes that's the best way to go at first versus going after the skill guys. Who does Marvin Lewis select? Marvin Lewis. <laughs> Stu the head coach. I just cannot believe Cincinnati. he's Cincinnati. I still don't believe he's the head coach. It, it, it's hard to fathom, honestly. It, it really is, but he's coming back for a uh, year 50, seemingly, as head coach of uh, the Bengals there in Cincinnati. This is interesting, yeah, because are they committed to Andy Dalton long-term? Honestly, I think Andy Dalton's best days as a quarterback in this league are behind him. I think Andy Dalton's going to want to trade. I, I, like, I've been saying this here. Who's going to want him? Year. Who's going to want him? I, think, I don't know. I, Who would, I, I, honestly, what, what has he done in the last couple years well, think about what to his, prove that he— his team has done? His team sucks. You know, he got a coach that sucks, like who should be fired. And when you, you lose that whole like love for the game when you're just like— with a team that's just just horrible, you know, and it's not getting any better. It's it, right. You, there's been no bright spots there. No. no bright. They have not been the same team since that meltdown against the Pittsburgh Steelers in the yes. wild card round a couple seasons ago. Uh-huh. They have not been the same team. Nope. Not like they've been a great postseason team for a long, long time. They haven't won a postseason game since 1990. Yeah, it's before I was born, Keith. Jeez. So. But as far as regular season goes, they have not been the same team since that wild card game a couple of years ago. They they just they don't do anything well consistently, remotely consistently enough. And uh, again, Andy Dalton, he just hasn't shown me anything. I get it. There's not much around him to work with, but still, you got to set yourself well, apart. Who's the somehow. best receiver he's had ever since? Since AJ Green. It's AJ Green. I'll I'll, I'll I'll say two, two great receivers his whole career. AJ Green and Chad Ojosinko. Those are his best receivers he's ever had. He's had uh, TJ Husmanjada for Muhammad a period Sanu, of time. But he's not like stud. No. He, they've had decent wideouts. Looks like the Bengals pick us in, by the way. Yep. But they've had decent they've had decent skill. I mean, um, Giovanni Bernard out yeah. of the backfield. Um They've had, you know what I mean? They've had decent players on that team, good skill position guys on offense, and they've had talented guys on defense too. Yeah, they they lost it because of the coach. I mean, let's just be quite frank. I think that's what it is. I think it's why they lose games is because of coaching. Uh, I, I've said it before. I think in the NFL, coaching mistakes are magnified the most yeah. out of all the four sports. Yeah. I continue to believe that. The, you know the team gets gets the praise when the win when the wins happen, yeah. and uh, the coaches do sometimes. But there's no doubt, coaches take the most blame during losses and when big mistakes they can be magnified uh, by the head coach. So it's going to be an interesting selection here by Cincinnati as the commissioner comes to the podium now. I'm sure the boos are raining down once again. Yep. 
And the uh, Bango. They go offensive line as well. Yep. They take Billy Price, uh, the go. center out of Ohio State. A lot of Ohio State Buckeyes being drafted here within the first yeah. uh, top 20 picks well, or so. let's think about this. They want to protect Andy Dalton. They got a, they got a center. Um, they can get better in so many other areas. You know what? Again, they got a talented team. It, uh, the problem is the coaching is the been the issue is losing the locker room that's been the biggest thing that's been going on with the the Cincinnati Bengals is they lose the locker room quickly and you know until they start to until they have you know coaches you know players start to respect the coaches they're going to always be that team that just set themselves up for failure the old school bad news bears but with no success (laughs) you know I I agree with you wholeheartedly Keith is Vontez perfect? Is he still, still doing some there. anger management classes, maybe? Maybe. He needs to over the summertime. Hopefully he does. You know? So you have the Baltimore Ravens coming up right now. And the needs of a Baltimore Ravens, when you look at it, is... Well, I think they need to get a little more younger on defense. Yeah. Honestly. Uh, a lot of the guys who've been there for so long are either not there anymore yeah. or... Terrell Suggs is still playing at a high level, but he's starting to get into uh, the latter well, portions older. of his career. Yeah, they, I think they need to get young. They have Courtney Upshaw as well. Uh, to me, it would be s- they need to get a little young. To me, it would be smart if they selected a linebacker right now. Mm-hmm. You know, I think they need to groom a linebacker now. Right, Terrell Suggs is still Terrell Suggs. He can groom that person and take him under their wing and kind of do. Same things with the Patriots did with had Gerard Mayo. Yep. You know, when they brought him in and then they brought in, you know, they, they brought in other players um, behind him, which is Seymour, who kind of grew Gerard Mayo, you know, that type of thing. So, up. Oh, and, and it looks like tight, we have a trade. trade. So, tight. Here we go. This is where it happens right now. Well, we know the Titans not going to pick Lamar Jackson. I mean, they have Marcus Mariota, and he's young. Absolutely. So I, you definitely want to know there. But if Marcus Mariota, but the Titans definitely, they lost they lost their cornerback from the Titans, the little forty kid who went over to Patriots. So yes. They did they did lose that, so they don't have that. They, but they did pick up Malcolm Butler. Yep. They do have Deion Lewis over there. This is a team you who. Know, Honestly, Keith, they could win here in 2018. They could, but you know where they, they're weak at? They're weak in their line. They, there's a lot of sacks. When you have Marcus Mariota running all over the place, you don't want a guy who's coming off a hamstring injury moving so moving going you know east to west constantly the whole time. And especially that's just wear and tear. He's got to be in the pocket type of player. I think you got to go with an offensive lineman. Yeah, you're right. Uh, they – they definitely need that. They could have used that a little bit more last year, uh, especially in the playoff game. They, they mounted that comeback against Kansas City in the wild card round, but one of the reasons they got down was because of pressure. The Chiefs were able to apply to Mariota. Absolutely, they could beef up that offensive line up front and help him out. Help out the running game. Like you said, you mentioned Deion Lewis there. Uh-huh. New head coach, Mike Rabel, he comes in. Another I Patriots. like Tennessee. I do. I, I like. I like what they did last year under Malarkey. Uh, obviously, they came up short in New England, and, and there was a big gap there, as we saw. They're they're not at that level yet. Yeah. I don't think they're at Jacksonville's level yet either. But they're easily the second best team in the AFC South, yeah. and I don't think they're too far behind the Jaguars. Uh-uh. I don't think they're that far. Obviously, the defense is not comparable. They're yeah. not there yet. But if they make a couple things here, like you said, if they can beef up the offensive line. If they can maybe uh, add some more guys later on this offseason, this is a team that could be one of those teams that's like a thorn in in people's sides this year. Yeah. They can be that Jacksonville Jaguar team. But let's just say it, Jacksonville Jaguar is the second best team in the AFC. Yeah. And hands down. Hands down at this point. Hands down at this point they are. Um, and it looks like the New England Patriots are going to get their guy. is what they want. It's interesting. You know, a lot of teams, you know, everybody needs a certain type of thing. But one thing some of these guys got to start, these GMs start doing is, as much as you hate Bill Belichick, I think you got to take a little page out of his book. And when whoever he's interested in, you got to take a look at it. Look, at It amazes team. me, right? I'm like, if he's talking about selecting that person, I'm going to take it out of his hand if I'm ahead of him. I, I want him. Why teams don't do this a lot more often or just – 
often at all it blows my mind, right? Yeah. Why not? But Why did teams make trades with him over the years as well? You know, for certain situations, uh, the Brandon Cook trades from last year yeah. to the Saints. It's, it's different things like that. It's like, why? why? Why don't they start? But again, that's Belichick always kind of being a step ahead of everybody before they can even see it. Yeah. So I, that just goes to you got to credit him, really, yeah. when it comes back to it. And maybe we'll see that maybe with Detroit. Not now, but in the near future uh-huh. if – Patricia has some success early on here, and may, maybe they they uh, morph into that type of, of team. We'll have to see. We'll have to see. They scored again. They just scored again. I, I literally watched that one happen right there. For nothing. <laughs> For nothing. Uh, this is unbelievable, man. Like, Golden Knights are coming here and and just scoring at will. This is just. This is. Look at that. He just. There's no defense there. You you supposed to just check him when he comes through like that. The way it's four against one, he just went right through. If you want to know any better, you would think this is Mario Lemieux, yeah. and Sidney Crosby t- uh, teaming up on Pittsburgh here. I mean, it's, it is amazing to watch. Wow, it's a thing of beauty. By the way, Tennessee selects Rashawn Evans, linebacker, linebacker out of Alabama. So they go defense there. They go defense. As I said. mentioned to you, they're a team who's close to knocking on the door of a Jacksonville, but not quite there yet. Biggest difference is the defense. Yeah. So they decide to go that side of the ball and uh, shore things up a bit and, and get a little deeper. Yeah. Now, I'm going to be surprised to see what the New England Patriots do right here. Very, very fast. Su- I wouldn't be surprised if they uh, – I mean, look. If they don't, if they don't start like Lamar Jackson, I'll be super, I'll be shocked because they've been very high on this kid. They do need a backup quarterback. You know, Brian Hoyer is not the answer. They lost Jimmy Garoppolo, and he was supposed to be that guy. I can tell you, Bill Belichick is not going to give up another quarterback for getting for a trade or anything like that. Knowing the Brady status, anyway. So, if they take Jackson here, they are making a. Uh clear distinction that Jackson is the guy that they look to be the successor to Brady. Yeah. Now, I like Lamar Jackson. I have questions regarding if his game can translate to the NFL. Uh But beyond that, Keith, the fact that that style and that skill set has not won. It's not won, though, at the NFL level as far as championships go. So that, to me, if you're a Patriots fan, uh, again, this is probably looking down the line. This is a future type of a pick. But it remains to be seen Look, if that can win ultimately. What you know? What I think what he's looking at is he's looking at those two games where Jimmy Garoppolo got hurt, Jacoby Brissett came in, and yeah, and the speed of that magnitude was very hard to stop. And that's just because their style is not they're they're, they're a typical sit in a pocket, throw in a pocket. That's the type of team they are. And. Lamar Jackson's not that player. Lamar Jackson's the kind of guy that likes to run. He's like a Michael Vick. Let's just call it what it is. He's, he's to me, the next Michael Vick. But but Michael Vick never won anything in the NFL. Though. I know. I understand that. But I'm just saying his style of play, he plays like Michael Vick. Oh, yeah. I agree. And I agree. It's a very, very similar skill yeah, set. And, he, and that's, to me, what they're going to get if – if we know that's what they, you know for sure that's what they're gonna select. But other 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 positions there, they need again a tight end, they Absolutely. need an o- offensive line, and they need a better receiver. I mean, offensively, they, I'm just I don't think the receivers they have are going to do justice to what they do. They need a a receiver that's going to give them separation. Um, it's going to be that quick off the ball. You got Julian Edelman coming back. It's going to be tough for him to get off that line, you know, get that separation in the beginning. And, you know, you got Gronkowski, you know. So I think you need another big, either big receiver that's going to give you some some type of separation from these corners. It's interesting. They actually have several needs. I would kind of put them in this pecking order. Number one, I'd go secondary. Uh-huh. Two, tight end depth. Three, offensive line. And four, I would actually go quarterback. Really? I would just because they're still win now mode. Their biggest problem last year was the defensive secondary. I mean, that, that's that's what hurt yeah. them in the end. They need more guys back there because, I mean, Patrick Chung is getting up in age a bit. Uh-huh. 
We know that we have the, the McCordy brothers back there now. And, uh, I mean, it's going to be interesting. I mean, is Eric Rowe going to start for them next year? No way. <laughs> so they have a huge need. They have a huge yeah, need Stephon there. Stephon Gilmore coming back. Gilmore's coming back. They have him. That That's a solid corner. He proved his worth yeah. towards the end of the season in the postseason. But still, they could add some more help in the secondary. That's what I would actually go here. But it looks like, again, they have fallen in love with Lamar Jackson. Those have been the reports all week long. I, like you, I'd be very surprised if they went away from him here and went in a different direction. Yeah. Uh, but tight end depth, they, they need, need it. They need it. I, there really isn't, by all accounts, a, a, a breakthrough uh, tight, tight end, end in there. this draft. No. So that that's probably why they're not looking in that direction at this point in time. Perhaps next year. Yeah. But offensive line, I'm with you. I echo those sentiments. They, they definitely need more help there, unless you think Lee Adrian Waddle is going to step in for Nate Soldier. No. I mean, that's going to be. Yeah, that's that's kind of interesting. I don't <laughs> know about that. You know, I think yeah, you got to go with the best. Well, you have to go with the best available. I mean, that's what you typically when you're at this point, you got to go with the best available, and uh, you know, um, hopefully they get it done. You, you see this uh, on the on the, on the flip side. Milwaukee beat Boston, so Game Seven. Here we come. Absolutely, uh, what we kind of thought. This has been a back and forth series with the Bucks and Celtics. They go to a Game Seven. I believe that will be on Sunday. I want to say. Yep. I believe that's going to be on Sunday in Beamtown, Boston. It's probably actually. Yeah, I think it's going to be on Sunday. Boston will probably win it, like we've talked about. Yeah. This has been a back and forth series. I don't trust Milwaukee to win a big time game seven, any game, but a game seven on the road. I know Giannis is going to bring it. Yeah. Jabari Parker has been playing better. Yeah. And it doesn't make any sense to me the way they've been playing. It just doesn't make any sense to me. They should be better than what they are. I, I, yeah, that's that's what I was saying last night. It kills me. It's got to it's got to be just ripping apart Bucks fans. Yeah. Edge yeah, of their seat, back and forth, nonstop, all along during this first round set against Boston, and uh, here they are in a game seven. It's fascinating. It's fascinating. They should be a lot better. Yeah. There's too much instability there. They need to improve, uh, and they need to get a new head coach going forward. We talked about that last night, mm -hmm. and uh, we think they will. Yeah. Well, we'll see. We'll, we'll definitely see. Um, we're still waiting on this Patriot pick. How many time, How much time left? I'm sure that they're about to select soon. I don't know what's taking them to me interested. The pick is in, so they're about to select right now. Yes. Um, and it looks like they're probably going to go with Lamar Jackson and people. That's what we're looking for, and I'm sure that's what it's going to be. Are you excited for that as a Patriots fan? What is your excitement level for that if it is Jackson? Well, it's my excitement. I, you know what? Until I see him actually play yeah. in the game, then I say, okay. But, I mean, I just know, like, they do need they do need a backup quarterback for sure. Yep. I mean Jimmy Garoppolo. I just Brian Hoyer is just not the answer. So I think I would try to sell that up as immediately and as soon as possible. So I'll I'll kind of be excited if they do pick it up Lamar Jackson. It's just something new or something different. Um, and then let's see is, is Belichick going to stay under? Is he going to stay longer for to groom Lamar Jackson? That's the next question. You know, a lot of question marks in New England at this point for a team that made it to the Super Bowl last it's year. In. and They do not go with the quarterback wow. at all, Keith. Uh, they go offensive line. There you go. There they go, go with Isaiah Wynn, offensive tackle out of Georgia. Wow. That's interesting. I That's said, telling. I told you. That, that, to me, is saying that you have to go offensive line. You lost Nate Chosen. You have to go with an O-line. You, you, you just... You got to get protection for Brady if he's expected to play another couple of years. You know, maybe they go with Lamar Jackson in next uh, next pick. I don't know. People are probably a lot of people out there are shocked because they're like, get Brian Hoyer out there, out of here. But they got, you know, I don't know, Lamar Jackson something. The thirty first pick. That's a long way. That's a long way. You know, and it's really interesting that he, they didn't go with him so far. Maybe. 
maybe they just maybe they're throwing a curveball here to people. They have people thinking Lamar Jackson's the thing, and then they select him, and then they're and then they take him at thirty one. Yeah, yeah. It's like we just mentioned a moment ago. It was one of their needs. They needed to upgrade the offensive line, and they did. They went after it and got that. That's that's. That's a great decision. And he can learn from one of the best, Stu, with Dante Scarnecchia, Stu being the offensive line coach while he's Stu there. I, I, I like the fact that they're bringing young guys in now while he's there because with Scarnecchia, we know he can teach these guys up. He can coach them up really quick for the most part, and it's somewhat of a plug-and-play then. Yeah. So hopefully that's the case here. They'll need that. And it will be fascinating here when they pick again at 31. Maybe they trade. Maybe they make a trade. Maybe there's something up Belichick's sleeve at this yeah. point. To, who knows? I think there's two wolves. I think we're bound to see something interesting, Stu, happen. Yeah. Whether it be with the Patriots or outside of them at the end of this first round before tonight's up. Yeah. I totally agree with you. Stu got um, Mason Rudolph, yes. the Oklahoma State quarterbacks on the board. Not a lot of people are talking about him. He's got a lot of upside. Uh-huh. So it's we'll a, see. We'll see. We'll definitely see. We'll take a break here on Behind the Mic. We'll come back. We'll continue with our NFL draft discussion. We'll also get into a little uh, NBA playoffs talk as well. As we mentioned before, Milwaukee defeats Boston tonight in Game 6. They force a Game 7 in Beantown this weekend. Angels and the Dodgers, both of those teams are off tonight. They're back in action tomorrow. And uh, we'll also get into, oh, don't forget, we're going to be talking with Jerry Porter later on tonight. He's going to call in former Oakland Raiders wide receiver. want to get his thoughts on how the Raiders are looking going into year one with John Gruden. Also, what draft day was like for him all those years ago. It's Behind the Mic, live from Kings Cove in the Toyota Sports Center. Every 17 minutes, make a wish makes the impossible possible. They tame dragons. They bring Saturn to Earth. They help superheroes save entire cities. They even make unicorns fly. All to give children the strength they need to fight their critical illnesses. Every wish takes muscle. Help us make sure every wish comes true. Join us at wish.org. Our military service members volunteer to protect us in the most dangerous places around the world. They step up. And when they are severely ill or injured, returning to their families is only the beginning of their long road home. Beyond all the hospitals and doctors and surgeries they need just to survive, they also deserve whatever they need to truly live. All the in-home care and day-to-day help they need to live independently, on their own terms. Wounded Warrior Project long-term support programs were established to provide these brave men and women whatever they need to continue their fight for independence at no cost for life. So many of them need us, and it's time for a grateful nation to step up. Find out how you can do your part at findwwp.org. We all come together and stand together to serve our veterans. We invest in the latest technology. We take the time to train the next generation of doctors and nurses. We work together to make sure we heal their bodies and their minds. This is our mission. More than 300,000 of us working as one, together with families and loved ones. No matter where they live in this country, we'll be there. We stand strong, united. Stand with us in caring for our veterans. Hi, I'm Danica Patrick and proud aunt. Watching my nieces grow, play, and learn is amazing, but not every child gets to be carefree. One in six kids in the U.S. are hungry. One in six. That little girl sitting alone at the playground, she can't play like the other kids. She doesn't have the energy because she's hungry. School lunch will be her only meal today. It breaks my heart that this is the reality in our country, but it's something that Feeding America is working to change. Each year, the Feeding America network of food banks rescues billions of pounds of good food that would have gone to waste. This food is then provided to families and children in need. Being a kid should be about using your imagination, learning, and having fun. These children shouldn't have to miss out on simply being a kid because they're hungry. To find out how you can help end childhood hunger in your community, visit feedingamerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. Everyone is talking about health care these days. 
America spends twice that of other developed countries on our health care system, yet our health ranks near the bottom. How can we stop spending so much and getting so little? Shifting to a system based on primary care can help fix the problem. Patients with a primary care doctor live longer, healthier lives and are less likely to suffer from cancer, heart disease, or stroke. Primary care that is comprehensive and coordinated also saves money. Patients who have a primary care doctor spend 30% less on health care than patients who don't. States with a high number of primary care doctors have lower health care costs and higher quality care. Primary care can help make America healthy again. To learn more about the benefits of primary care, visit www.healthisprimary.org. This message is brought to you by America's Family Physicians. You're listening to Behind the Mic with Brad Dalius. Take us with you on the go. Download the official Behind the Mic app today. You can also listen online, BehindTheMicShow.com. Check out our podcast on iHeartRadio. Brad and Keith hanging out at King's Cove on this Thursday evening. The NFL draft is in uh, full swing, as you all know by now. They're up to uh, pick 24 now. Carolina just selected DJ Moore, the wide receiver out of Maryland. Good pick for him. Keith and I were just talking about off the air here, how Carolina needs to add some more skilled players at the receiver position. We know they have Cam Newton. He's still a young guy at the quarterback spot. So Lamar Jackson still remains on the board. And the same can also be said for Mason Rudolph, too. This has been an interesting draft so far. We've seen uh, a lot of defensive guys taken so far, a lot of offensive tackles, offensive guards. You're seeing teams pick smart. Yeah. I think that, and not taking big risk. Outside of Cleveland. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think Cleveland took the biggest risk of them all so far by taking Mayfield number one. You know, It's I, not I'm, even close, actually. And I'm interested. It's interesting to see what Tampa Bay did is, you know, expect they, they selected uh, Vita Vey, who's a great defensive tackle. Um, you know, I, I honestly thought that they would probably select the quarterback because just it looked like the coach was frustrated with Jameis Winston, and a lot of people are. But it looks like they're going to give him the nod again for this upcoming season. And hopefully he can lead the way. Hope he can do a better job than what he's doing. I think this would be his last shot. I personally would have set myself up for uh, a, good, a good quarterback, though, in yeah, this situation. Did, in, um, in, I like Lamar Jackson. I was going to say, in Keith Jackson's mock draft, you had Tampa taking Jackson, Jackson right? Jackson, yeah. yeah. I, believe I, I believe I had him taking Lamar Jackson. And I thought that they could, you know, they get the same type of style of play what Jameis is doing. Um, but it looks like they're going to go with Jameis. Um, and but I'm not mad at, I'm not really mad at the decision that they did in terms of Vita Vey. I think he's a great player. They they get, do get bigger in that in that aspect. Um, but I really do think they need to get a better backup quarterback uh, quarterback because I don't think Jameis Winston's the answer. I'm surprised Vita Vea dropped this far in the draft. Because in my mock draft last night, I think I had him going like around in the top 10, definitely. Uh-huh. This is an athletic guy. Played at Washington, played Penn State in the Fiesta Bowl. Just a freak of nature. You're not going to find too many defensive tackles like him in the draft. Great pickup. They need all kind of help on defense. Tampa Bay, whether it be up front, in the secondary, they just got torched last year yeah. on the defensive side of the ball. So they definitely needed to upgrade on that side. I like you. I think, like I told you last night, I was tempted to almost draft them a quarterback because of my uncertainty with Winston, just like you yeah. at this point. But I guess management is committed to him, and and Dirk Cutter comes back again. Uh, it was a little surprising they retained him for 2018. Uh, it's it's a must win year. They've got to have a winning record. I don't know if they necessarily need to make the playoffs for him to be safe, but they got to have a winning record. Yeah, they got to improve big time, and obviously that will be dependent upon Winston's ability to uh, progress here in 2018. To me, with him, it's all about the maturity. Yeah, a big reason why he doesn't succeed on the field 
is probably because his off the field antics are getting in the way. Probably. You think about it. Yeah. He, he has tendencies sometimes to, to be a little lazy with this stuff. He lets unnecessary distractions come into his life. That's been evident. Yes. And it has clearly affected his performance on the field. I, I think it's led to some of his teammates. I don't know this for sure. I'm just speculating. But some of his teammates losing trust in him and confidence in certain spots. Uh-huh. But then again, it clicks back into motion where they... It seems like they they're give like, him an eye. right, right. They see flashes like we've seen as well. Just monitoring him here in his first couple of years in the league. Yeah, I, I still, I, I like what they did here because I, I like them. I, I still got to have confidence in him at least for another year. But this will be the tell-all season. Yeah, this will be. If he doesn't get it done this year, uh, his his stock will take a big plunge going for it. I, I, I totally agree with you. I think. Uh, this is it. I think this is his last straw, and you know, I, I, I'm not hoping he. I'm really wishing he does the. He, you know, he does well this upcoming season. You know, it's always a new season. You want to see those teams that kind of had to fall off. You want to see those those guys drop gum come back up. And James Wilson had an incredible college career, and he's just struggled a little bit through 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 the NFL and the pros. So. Hopefully he can this year can be the year that he really gets together. I mean, you got players like Deshaun Jackson on your team, Vincent Jack, uh, Vince Jackson, and who's the other guy they have? Uh, I forgot the other receiver, uh, Martin. 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 Doug Martin. Doug Martin. Um, you got some great players on your team, and you can get the ball to. So we'll see. You know, hopefully things will work out for them. You know, I was just thinking about Brad. Yeah. Lamar Jackson may go to the Seattle Seahawks. They don't. Russell Wilson is their back as their quarterback right now. I believe the quarterback that they had before is gone. The guy that they had from uh, that from TCU from a couple years ago he got in some trouble. I believe he was released. He's not on the team anymore. Not Austin Davis, Stephen Morris. Yeah, he's gone. They, so you don't hear about their back with quarterbacks too often in Seattle. So that, yeah. that right. That, but that Seattle, they had, a, they had a they had a great. But this guy was from TCU. He was a great. He was a great quarterback, uh, and he was from TCU. And uh, he played. I forgot his name. He got into a little bit of trouble off the. Uh, oh, Trevon, Trevon Boykin. Trevon Boykin. That was their backup. He's no longer there, and I can see. Lamar Jackson going to the Seattle Seahawks. Mm, that's very interesting. Yeah. That's interesting, yeah. They could use a quarterback like that. It would fit their mold of what they do. Yeah. But I don't I don't know. I don't know if they will pull the trigger I on mean, that. I mean, they, they got to get better in their de- in defense. They definitely lost yes. Richard Sherman. They lost some players. But, I mean, they got a few picks. And... Um, but I can see them. I think Lamar Jackson is going to be their pick. I think Lamar Jackson is going to be their pick. Well, at this point, Russell Wilson is still in his prime. You figure, I mean, but he's, he's sidetracked not... with baseball. Yeah, he's trying to play baseball. baseball. <laughs> he's trying to play baseball with the Yankees in spring training. But still, I, I, I don't know. I, I will not take a quarterback here. I would try and improve the defense, like you just mentioned before, because. Yeah. Especially in this division now, with quarterbacks like Jimmy Garoppolo, yeah. Jared Goff, you're gonna need studs defense. on defense. Yes, especially in the secondary to be able to slow down those guys. If you don't have that, you're gonna get torched. Yeah, that's true. I mean, they are they are gonna get carved up. They're an aging defense, as you mentioned, and they really, I, I think, they have to go defense. Yeah, and another one is Pittsburgh. What did they do? They got Shazier <laughs> coming back. You know, I think he'll come back. I think he's still an injury, so I think he's going to be out for another season, maybe. Yeah, no, he, he by all accounts, he should come back in yeah, 2018. He should come back in 2018. I, I laugh, though, just because of it. it's the never-ending soap opera yeah. of the Pittsburgh Steelers. Yeah. They get Le'Veon Bell. They got Antonio Brown. They got basically their whole team back, Roethlisberger. I mean, where do they get better in? Offensive, I mean... To I me, think defense. defense. I think you go defense. You have to, yeah, you, yeah, because you don't know how, what conditions his is going to be in, you know, uh, coming but I, back. Yeah, I would go secondary. Look, they haven't been able to replace Troy Polamalu yet since he's retired. That's true. They, they And then James Harrison, they did reach track out. They tried to get James Harrison before he retired. Yeah. And James Harrison was like, no. So he has bad blood for him, I guess. <laughs> 
that's what it is, and he's decided to retire. So they're probably – yeah, you're probably right. They'll probably go into, into a defensive set and go defensively. Uh, but – it's going to be some good – look, there's some great teams out here. You got the Jacksonville Jaguars at the 29th pick. You got the Vikings at the 30th pick, 31. And then you got the 31 pick is you got the New England Patriots, and then you got the Eagles. And then after that, first round's over. All these teams are after Seattle picks right here, like you said, these, these last couple teams here at the end of the first round, these are teams who can all win in 2018, obviously. Yes. With these last five, the ones you just mentioned. To me, Minnesota is the most intriguing here at 30 out of these last couple of picks because they're a team, as I've been saying a while now, who since they've signed Kirk Cousins, it is win or go home in 2018 for them. They have to win. Uh, they've pushed all their chips towards the middle of the table for this season. And what it's what do they do? And uh, are they confident that Dalvin Cook comes back 100% right away? Or do they think there's enough there on offense? Uh, do they go defense? They had a defense last year that was uh, really uh, historically, statistically really good in the regular season. However, they completely flopped yeah. uh, in the NFC title game, as we know, in Philly. So maybe do they go to defense? This, this is very interesting with them because they could go either way. They could opt for more depth on offense or they could go for defense. And, um, yeah, it – this is this is a pick that they definitely I think need to uh, need need to make sure they get a quality player here one way or another for them. Yeah, I totally just because agree. of the pressure for them to win this year. Yeah, well, you got Kyle Rudolph, you got players on the team, and yeah, you got a great team, and you you had that embarrassment loss. Yeah. you know uh, that really sucks. The way, you know the way they lost. Um, they lost against the Philly, Philly Philadelphia yeah, the Eagles. You know, you were favored to win, and you lost to the Philadelphia Eagles like that. I mean, you don't lose like that. And to me, just getting throttled on defense like that—that's where I think you have to go. You got to go with the. You got to go with a better defense uh, because in a postseason, what you're looking for is postseason players. I think they will go with players that they can trade and get some veteran guys in there for postseason players because, like you said, they want to win now. I don't think a rookie. On a defensive end, going. To, I mean, there's great rookies like Gerard Mayo came in as a rookie and he played well, you know. But there's not too many rookies out there on defense that's going to, you know, do right away. Do right away, doesn't happen. Really, you know, when you look at you talk about guys like that who can come in, plug and play from day one. I think of Bradley Chubb and how he's got the potential to be a stud for the Broncos. Yeah. As we kind of look at the AFC West as well, we mentioned earlier the Chargers selected the safety James. Derwin James out of Florida State. Great pickup for him. He's going to help right away. Absolutely. Denver, very similar. They go defense, Chubbs. help right away. And then uh, Oakland, they decide to go with, who did the Raiders pick again? Uh, Colton Miller from UCLA. Yeah, offensive line. Well, That's offensive right. They line. go offensive line. So you go two defense, offensive line. And uh, to me, this the AFC West, the way it's shaping up right now is – you have teams like like Denver, who it looks like John Elway Stu thinks that they can win right now in the yeah. short term. Yeah. Which I don't know if they can with the quarterback with Case Keenum because I don't I don't know if Case Keenum is taking you to the promised land. No. He proved that last year for me. Yeah. He definitely did. He you know for me too. I just I think you're going to see very similar to what they has last year. Right. Yeah, the defense can get really hot. And then on the offense side of the ball, that that's the that's the position and the area that struggles the most. Yeah. And I, if they think they're going to go back to what they did during the year of Super Bowl Fifty, where they ride an aging Peyton Manning and a quarterback that's arm was falling off to the Super Bowl with the defense, I think that would be a mistake. Because uh, because that was a, a once in a, in a generational type of season and yeah. situation where they were able to ride that high flying defense, the no fly zone. I don't know if you're going to see that again from them. As the Atlanta Falcons select Calvin Ridley, the yeah. highly touted receiver out of Alabama, so Ridley is off the board. And that he was a great. He was a great player in the play in the playoffs. You yeah, know. in the college football playoff. Yes. He, yeah, he was uh, probably maybe one of the best receivers in this draft yeah. between him and Moore out of Maryland. Again, I thought th- that was an area. I mean, like I said, I'm not I'm not questioning the Patriots' pick. 
but that was an area I thought we could get better in as a receiving core. But they never I think take they receivers. Will, yeah, they, uh, yeah, I can see them taking. Honestly, it's going to be interesting. No one's just said anything, but it's going to be interesting where Des Bryant goes. I'm interested to see if the Patriots are even going to talk to him. They haven't really came out a report that said they were going to look at him. Yeah, I haven't heard that myself. Now, it's interesting. Reports came out earlier this week that Dez rejected an offer from Baltimore. Yeah, that was, I remember saying that earlier. Yeah, they rejected the, the off of Baltimore. But did, wasn't he drafted by Baltimore early, uh, before? Baltimore tried to get him in his, when he was first when he first started. Really? Yes. I Coming think, out of Oklahoma State? Yeah. I think Baltimore was trying to get him before, and I think they traded him. He went to Dallas. I think that's how he ended up in Dallas. I was reading something up about that. He so, was he was highly touted. Yeah, he was for a uh, lot of teams. Yeah, and and I think now they tried to come get him back, and he probably said no. No, he he balked at it. Look yeah, at that. yeah, we'll we'll definitely look it up. It is going to be interesting to see where Dez goes because we feel he can still help a team out. Yeah. But beyond this year or in the next two years, I don't know. We don't maybe know how healthy he is also. that That's another concern for teams is his health and his ability to have enough stamina to make it through an entire season. Uh-huh. That could be in question too here. So his raw talent is there. But like I said, I, I think the biggest problem that's hurting him right now from being signed is maybe – his durability, his longevity, his uh, stamina to stay on for a whole season when it, when a team would need him. I would love it to see him go to New England as a Pats fan, as you yeah. know. Great red zone target. I That'd don't know great. if it's going to happen. No, I don't think it's going to happen either. I definitely don't think it's going to happen. But it'll be interesting if they, they try to go out. You know, Odell was out there and everybody was trying to do that Odell train. But Odell looks like he's staying where he's at. <laughs> He's staying along with uh, the new incomer of Saquon Barkley, Eli Manning, and uh, they're going to try and turn it around big time in 2018 yep. in New York. Yep. Well, we'll see what happens. I, 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 it's going to be interesting to see where he goes. Le'Veon Bell, I guess he's going to stay in. in uh, he's staying in uh, Pittsburgh. In Pittsburgh. And it looks that way. They have until they have until July seventeenth. I want to say about yeah. the middle of July. Well, he's staying. He does this every year. He does. He's just trying to get more money. Yeah, he does this every year. So there's no question about Le'Veon Bell. He's staying. The interesting Jaguars. You know, you go to the Jaguars and and, and Jaguars got a, a great selection. And then we had mentioned earlier that you know Wembley, uh, you know their GM's about to go ahead and. Put a bid in for the Wembley in London. So this I mean, made big news earlier today. You're right, yeah. Keith. Shad Khan, the owner of the Jacksonville Jaguars, essentially put in a bid to purchase Wembley Stadium where they play the NFL London games each year. Uh-huh. This, The report surfaced maybe, I don't know, about a year ago now that possibly Jacksonville is a team that in the future could move to a London. Yeah. Honestly... I'm all for it. You really are? I'm all for it. I want to see a team internationally based full-time. I want to see... I I miss the old NFL Europe. The original concept of NFL Europe was great. Ultimately, it folded. It didn't work out. But now with the NFL itself, not just a a, a, um, a spinoff of the NFL, but the actual NFL extending and branching out uh, one of their own franchises into uh, the international market, into London. But I think it would be great. I, I want to see the National Football League continue to expand internationally. I want to see American football grow popularity-wise. Maybe we get a team in Mexico City in the future. Yeah, that, that would be cool. But my thing is, is the travel that's going to get very expensive for that. I mean, that's a lot of traveling to go, especially in the AFC West, uh, where they are. You know, that's you know, those teams are be traveling from you can imagine who's in that think about who's in that league. You have you have in the AFC West. You, you got the LA, LA, the Chargers, the Chargers, Denver. The Chargers going all the way to London, that's a less a minute. Like that's gonna be a serious travel. You would almost have to do you have, a bye like coming off the bye week. Yes. Like the bye week is the week before and then, you know, they travel right after it. And just think about the, like the home teams. Like, okay, so how many home games they get a year? Like six? They divide it up. So it's like six home games. 
You know, it's a total of where they play four. No, they play fourteen games in the sixteen games in the season. So they get eight, eight home eight. games, eight and eight, eight home games. So eight teams traveling to London, that would be very, very tough to do, and it's a lot of money. I, I, I can't. Oh, but I, we know, Keith, that they got the money to do it. They got the money, but that's just I can't dropping see the bucket. I, I just cannot see that happening. I'm not really on a. I see what you're saying in terms of making NFL global, but I just can't. I think that'd just be a lot of, on the players to be traveling that far out there. I, I get the one time a year both teams to go and the families go and this and that, but that's going to be very hard of a hard of an adjustment. I can't see it. This is something that would almost have to be negotiated from the players' union into yes. the new CBA, which I think comes around in like 2020, 2021. And owners. And yeah. NFL owners are they for that because, again, that's a that's a long ride. It's a lot of – that's going to be a big toll. It, them coming back from the game. So they say they play on Sunday, right? Them yep. coming back, they won't get back to probably like Tuesday. If yeah, go if they sl- go from like London yeah, to LA, yeah, yeah, and then they got to play. What is it about like a, a five hour flight from New York? Yeah, so yeah, you figure eight hours yep. or so. You're talking about Tuesday. Travels yeah. on all day on Monday, so you come back Tuesday. You come back Tuesday. Then think about it. So Tuesday you got treatment. Tuesday treatment. Wednesday Wednesday film. Thursday is practice, and then Friday. You know Friday. You're going in if you travel it, you travel it Friday again. That's just tough. That's tough. That's tough. Again, they would have to almost like work around or work with the schedule makers here to put teams who travel to London during the bye week or maybe put their bye week the week after the London game. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like they'd have to almost do something like that if they want to do it full time, but I can really see this being a thing down the line. Uh-huh. As it continued to expand, look, it's a pipe dream to think that yeah. American football is going to catch on to such a popular level such as FIFA and uh-huh. soccer and the World Cup. World Cup is coming to Russia this summer, by the way. Yeah. But I, it, it, it's unlikely to get to that point, at least any time in the near future. But the fact that they could actually have an NFL franchise in Europe, not just a spinoff league like NFL Europe was back in the day, uh, that would, I think, take a good step uh, forward in the right direction. Look, they like it. They, they've sold out that Wembley Stadium for years now. It's yeah. only grown since that first Giants game back in 2007. The quality of play has gotten better. They've done a better, better job of scheduling yeah. good opponents to have quality football uh, for the people to come and see out there. and. Uh, there is a somewhat of a demand for it. Yeah, I, you know what? I wouldn't be for – I don't think I'm all for it being something as, you know, uh, bringing to the league to, like, a regular home, regular season game, like bringing that into being a actual, like, the Jackson – the Jaguar – London Jaguars. I'm not into that. But I would love – you know what I would love to see there? A Super Bowl. Ooh, that would be a fun. A Super Bowl in London? I can, now, that is something to see. That would be fun. Yeah. So you're saying maybe they almost start in that direction first. Yes. Where they host like a, a big game like that there. A Super Bowl. Yeah. I'll try the, you know, the Pro Bowl is it's, it's tough to do that, but I will go with Super Bowl. I will go with a Super Bowl game. I like that. And, and, and go from there and see how the owners and everything likes the city, you know, things like that, and then go – and see if you can venture out to doing something else more. So, you know, that that would be something to see. They're going to have to do something with that stadium down there in Jacksonville. Eventually, yeah, eventually. Gonna, the, the lease is going to run up also, or they're going to have to renovate. So The pool in we'll the see. stands, that is awesome. That The Jacksonville Jaguars stadium is awesome. Do you have what, – what stadium has a pool – in the stadium that people the the, fan, the fans can swim in. Oh, that's like, phenomenal! That is so like wow. Yeah, I that, love that. that. That is awesome. Not, I don't know any football stadium like that. That is so much fun. That seems like a lot of fun. The only stadium I can think of in general is maybe Chase Field, the Diamondbacks. Yeah. In Phoenix, I was hoping the Rams did something like that. The yeah, LA right. Eagle and like, yo, some jacuzzis in the third <laughs> floor. That would be sweet. No but, one would get out. They could just hang out there the whole time. Yeah, but that would be awesome. 
That's I think one of the best stadiums in in the uh, in NFL. Jacksonville, yeah, that, the it's pool? pretty wild. Come on. Why they don't draw more people? I don't know. I think it's the city. It's in Jacksonville. You know what I mean? It's alone, but and that's also the thing that this conversation can branch off into the the thinking of. Well, why doesn't he just buy a new stadium in Jacksonville yeah. versus the one in London? But I think Shad Khan is a good businessman, and he sees the bigger picture. And with his franchise possibly having the ability to make more money long term in London than Jacksonville, yeah, I, I think I don't think he wants to put money into buying a new stadium in Jacksonville or uh, putting up money for renovations. Look Although they probably get pictures. the city to do that. How you not want to? That go is to phenomenal. The, I mean, come on, look at the that. Look. That is a great scene. The pool in the stand. I mean, I wonder how much it costs just for just to like what? What is the cost? To go to the game and just be in the pool. I mean, look, you're in Jacksonville. It's very humid out there on top of that. But the pool in the stands, that is awesome. It doesn't get much better than that. It's underrated in a sense. It's yeah. very underrated. I, I, how? 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 That doesn't make any sense. I'm wondering if they – I wonder how long they had that there for, Keith, or if they put that in after. Remember a couple of years ago before Jacksonville got good, they had so many TV blackouts, they couldn't yeah. even air the game locally down there? Yeah, that's I wonder true. if maybe they put that in after all those blackouts to draw some more people back in. They probably did. They probably did. But I'm just looking – this is just right here. It's just You got the top view. I, I would rather – honestly, I would be in the nosebleeds like, oh, I want to be in the pool. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, you got you know that that's just great. Yeah, there, there's no nice way that was there for the Super Bowl back in 05, no. Pats and Eagles. I, I don't think that that's definitely new since that then. Is. That's a lot of people in that pool, though. That's like a little three feet pool. They probably just got tired of it. They got to clean it up and stuff like that. But it's awesome. It is great. As I said, very underrated. <laughs> So we'll see where this thing goes and if the story grows legs. The Jacksonville Jaguars maybe eventually moving to London down the line. It's not going to happen this year, next year, or in the next couple of years. But perhaps in 2020, 2021, or beyond, I'm all for it. I'd love yeah. to see it. Once again, it's Behind the Mic. We're live from Kings Cove inside the Toyota Sports Center, El Segundo. The Vegas Golden Knights, they're off to a red-hot start tonight. Four goals. Four goals in the first period, in the first six minutes, Keith. Yeah. I mean, just came flying out of the gates in the NBA. Only one playoff game tonight. Bucks win and go to game seven. Yes. That's that's a great thing. Of course, we have the NFL draft going on. A very moving scene right now as we see. We just talked about it a little bit ago. Ryan Chazier walking out onto the floor. Uh-huh. And, and right uh, yeah, uh, very emotional scene there he's, as he's accompanied by his wife, moving very gingerly, obviously, uh, to the podium to announce the Steelers' pick here at 28th. It's great to see him be able to walk again. That was a scary scene. I remember watching that game. I saw that game from the jump. And that was a very scary scene to see what happened to that guy, to happen to him. Uh, Good to see him walking about. And, and, the, and, the, and, and the Pittsburgh Steelers did the right thing by going ahead and selecting a safety. I mean, you needed to get defensively better, I think, and they got a big – you know what's interesting? They got a big safety, just like Jacksonville Jaguars and the Ramsey. That's a big corner that they have over there. Yes. And they went with a big safety. So that's probably something they're trying to implement in. Like, we need to get bigger guys – to cover these receivers. It's true, though. Well, you got receivers who are six feet, six four, Muhammad Sanu's, the, you know, uh, Julio Jones is out there. Uh, you know, when you get big receivers like that, guys like Gronkowski, you need big safeties and things like that that can to match up to that. So I, I like the move that the, the Pittsburgh Steelers made. And, uh, you know, we'll we'll see if, if it does them any good this upcoming season. Yeah, it's but, like we just talked about before, right? Got to go safety, got to get younger, got to find the next Troy Palomalo. Yeah, but I'll say this. The way Shazier is walking up the, up to the podium very gingerly, it's not, he's not playing in 2018. I was, I was, you took the words right out of my mouth. I was, just gonna, I was thinking the exact same thing. Yeah. It's, it's not looking likely. At this point, we're just happy that he's walking. He's walking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How true, right? 
Great. I, I mean, man, what a blessing to, to be able to walk again. I mean, God, that injury was vicious and scary to see that this yeah. guy couldn't even feel his feet. So I'm great. I'm happy to see that he's walking. Yeah, same in this corner as well. Yeah, you never want to see that. Hopefully we don't really see it again. No. And as Odell Beckham is tweeting, God is so good. That is so true. Yeah, it's very, very emotional scene there. Steelers fans feeling it as well down in Dallas. It's been a great scene, by the way. Uh, they, they really have gone all out, pop and circumstance, the whole nine yards. Last year they have it in Philly. They have it at the Art Museum. People are crying right now and just happy to see Six here out there walking. You know, it's great to see that. You know, you look at the fans. They're, they're in tears right now to see that guy coming up and walking again. That's just a great, like you said, it's a great scene. I'm glad the Pittsburgh Steelers did that. Absolutely. As I was saying, last year it's in Philly at the Art Museum. This year they have it, like, actually on the field itself down there in Arlington. So, uh, so far they've done a great job. And once again, Lamar Jackson is still on the board as the Jacksonville Jaguars, who we were just talking about, uh, they are now on the clock. We'll see where they go. Maybe do they go with the quarterback, Keith, for long term? They're yeah. committed to Bortles for the next year or two, signing that contract this offseason, but they could add another quarterback because we still don't think he's the long-term answer. Well, yeah, that's, that's right. You're totally right. Um, we'll see. I don't know. I mean, I can, I can definitely see uh, them going with um, – I could definitely see them going with uh, with Lamar Jack. I think Lamar Jackson was a uh, um, was basically. Uh, I think Lamar Jackson was basically so just. I think Belichick was trying to play somebody. <laughs> I wouldn't I, doubt I, it. I, I wouldn't <laughs> doubt it. I, I wouldn't doubt it. I think Lamar Jackson was. I think he tried to he bamboozle some people, and now they're not going to pick him. But he may pick him up. But we'll see. I, I, I can't see it. It can possibly happen though. So. Mason Rudolph still on the board. We've been talking about him a lot tonight as well. A lot of defensive guys going off the board here in the first round. Teams filling a lot of needs, trying to create a lot more depth. We talked about how the biggest first of the night so far, in my opinion at least, has got to be Baker Mayfield going to the Browns. They pulled the trigger on that one. It, it's, it's a big risk. It is a big risk to go with him. So we'll see, obviously, if, if it pays out. But so a lot of these picks have been safe for me outside of that. If you go down the list here, we talked about it, especially a lot of these teams taking defense, offensive linemen, trying to beef up, trying to trying to build it inward out versus the other way around. What do you think about Arizona taking Josh Rosen? That, that, that I, I to like, me, you know, I think it's a win. I think it's a win in their aspect because Josh Rosen is the. I think the ready, the uh, basically the ready, the quarterback that's ready to go now. Um, with Sam Bradford signing a one-year deal, uh, I think they're, they're that's just saying they're not really committed to Sam Bradford, and they're looking for something long-term. And I think Josh Rosen is a great guy. You know, he starts off in the city, you know, a brand new team. Let's say this, let's just call it what it is. It's a brand new team. Uh, you know, there Fitzgerald's on the on the t- in the end of his career, going at, at the end, and so you know, and they're going to get some guys in there. And they're going to get a new, brand new coach, and they're going to get some guys in there, young guys, and really revamp this this team again. You still got Mike Brown over there, uh, who's a very speedy receiver. So, I mean, I think it's a great. I think it was a great addition for them, uh, and uh, you know, the, and he can possibly start. I mean, he can battle Sam Bradford. For a year, but I think they're going to go with Sam Bradford for the simple fact that they only give him one year deal. They're not going to waste that money on him, and they're going to try to give him the nod first. But uh, I think it was a good. I think it was a good move on their part to go with a backup quarterback or a quarterback that could possibly possibly start. Big winners tonight in my book are the Arizona Cardinals. New era for them, obviously. New head coach. You were talking about there. They want to go in the right direction. I think they've played it very smart so far this offseason. They get Sam Bradford. We both know he's not taking to a Super Bowl. That's not what he's going to do. Yeah. But they get him on a good deal for just a one-year tender. Uh-huh. And uh, you get your guy here now with Josh Rosen, who I think, when we look back on this NFL draft, Keith, the best quarterback who will have the best career will be Rosen at the end of the day. I really right. believe that. That's- I think he'll be the best, and I think Arizona 
will look back at this time and they will say that this is the day they got their quarterback, their franchise quarterback yeah. long term. I think he has a more promising promising uh, career than the rest of them. For the simple fact, I think he's going to get the nod from the jump and he's going to get more, a lot more reps than the other guys. I think Tyrod Taylor is going to be there for a while, so Baker Mayfield is only going to really get preseason and that's it. You got... Josh Allen is going to who are you Josh Allen is going to Buffalo. To Buffalo. Cold Buffalo. He's going to very cold Buffalo, but I just don't think they got some great receivers over there. But again, I think he's going to be a backup. Um and then you have Lamar Jackson who's still on the board, so you don't know where he's gonna go. Sam Darno. Sam Darnold would get a little bit of more he'll get some a lot more reps. Uh but it's gonna be out of Josh Rose and Sam Darnold. Darnold, and that's interesting. The USC UCLA combo again, exactly. But they're the the two that are going to get the most uh, game playing, uh, in play. You know, a lot more game playing than the other guys for sure. So, you know, out of those two, just like you had mentioned earlier, that Sam Darnold, uh, his selection, his in terms of making decision making, is not the best. And Josh Rosen's decision making is, I gotta go with Josh Rosen as well. I think Josh Rosen's gonna have a better, uh, he's gonna be better out the bunch from the jump. I agree, and and the fact that you look at the markets where they're going to, Josh Rosen is going to Arizona, a team who's not really projected to do much this year. There's not a whole lot of pressure on that franchise. Yeah, there really isn't if you think about it. New head coach coming on, new everything essentially, new era for the Arizona Cardinals. He, Sam Bradford is uh, going to be starting quarterback at least to begin 2018. We know that for sure. He can come in. He can learn. He can uh, get his reps in practice. Not a big media market as compared to New York and L.A., as we know, in Phoenix. That's a very good spot for him. On the flip side, you have Sam Darnold, who goes to the biggest media market of them all in New York, yeah. uh, a franchise that has been dying for a quarterback who's missed on so many quarterbacks over so many years and so many decades in the draft. Yeah. So much pressure for him not only to eventually succeed there, but to succeed sooner versus later. Yeah. They're going to look for him, Keith, really to probably play in 2018 because you're looking at, on that roster, at quarterback, Christian Hackenberg, Bryce Petty, Josh McCown. You cannot tell me that Josh McCown <laughs> yeah, is yeah. going to start all 16 games for the New York Jets in 2018. No. Or Christian Hackenberg. No. Or Bryce Petty. No. It's, it's Sam Darnold. <laughs> you're you're going you're gonna to hear the calls for Darnold very quickly. Yes, you really are. And, and the way the Jets fans are, it's going to be brutal. It's going to be immediately. It's not going to be... It's not going to be, oh, it's no working in slow with those guys. It's immediately. You're going to... Sam Darnold's going to get the nod. So, and so much pressure for him. So much is. pressure. That's something like, he's not really going to have an opportunity to sit back behind a guy. So, what's he going to learn from Josh McCown? Yeah. With all due respect, he, he's he's coming in thinking he's going to replace Josh McCown at the get go. Yeah. So he, so much pressure uh, to perform in New York, and, and and to perform at a high level right away. Uh, this this is why we both thought he should have came back to USC for another year to develop those skills versus just being thrown to the wolves on Sunday against NFL defenses from the beginning. Yeah, But it's going to be fascinating to follow both careers. As you said, Rosen out in Phoenix with the Cardinals and then uh, Sam Darnold as he begins his NFL career with the New York Jets. And we may see the next quarterback for the New England Patriots this next round. We'll see. they got six minutes to pick. Their pick's not in yet. But uh, it looks like maybe Lamar Jackson is picked this round. I don't know. What else? Like you said. Is this a, a spot? It's a spot. Maybe it's a spot for him. Yeah. I don't is. think they go tight end here because I don't, I don't see any, any big tight ends on the board, according to Mr. Mel Kuyper and Todd McShay at this point. Yeah. Are, are they going to go? So many safeties and corners have been taken they off do, the board. They do, they, they do need a corner, though. They do. They, need they a do. Corner, but... but Maybe they go. Maybe they go with the quarterback now. At this maybe point. they have to. I think they have to because how much longer are Jackson and Rudolph going to stay on the board? Yeah, I I think you have to you have to take it and and for them that would be good. I mean that you know they pick there at uh, twenty four and then thirty one and they fill two needs. That's the thing about Bill Belichick, man. He just knows what people are going to select and pick. 
and he probably knows like hey they're gonna pick this so i'm gonna go ahead and i'll wait and see what else we can get out of this and he's gonna wait till the last moment and maybe this is destined for him to pick the backup quarterback you just you you gotta get better at the quarterback position for the simple fact that tom brady is towards the end of his career and you just brian hoyer is just not your answer no, I keep saying that. No, no, you're not kidding. Yeah, you're not kidding at all uh, with that one. And by the way, last three picks here, Pittsburgh, Jacksonville, and Minnesota, they all go defense. Yes. All go defense. Jacksonville gets a defensive tackle out of Florida, and Minnesota goes with Hughes, uh, the cornerback out of Central Florida. So teams are trying to tighten up on that side of the ball. They looked at what Jacksonville did last year. They looked at what the Jaguars did last year, and obviously they had tremendous success with it. So, again, as Key said, New England is on the clock right now, pick 31. We'll see. Do they go with Lamar Jackson? Do they go with Mason Rudolph? We'll find out. It's Behind the Mic, live from Kings Cove, coming back for more after this. Our military service members volunteer to protect us in the most dangerous places around the world. They step up. And when they are severely ill or injured... Returning to their families is only the beginning of their long road home. Beyond all the hospitals and doctors and surgeries they need just to survive, they also deserve whatever they need to truly live. All the in-home care and day-to-day help they need to live independently, on their own terms. Wounded Warrior Project long-term support programs were established to provide these brave men and women whatever they need to continue their fight for independence at no cost for life. So many of them need us, and it's time for a grateful nation to step up. Find out how you can do your part at findwwp.org. We all come together and stand together to serve our veterans. We invest in the latest technology. We take the time to train the next generation of doctors and nurses. We work together to make sure we heal their bodies and their minds. This is our mission. More than 300,000 of us working as one, together with families and loved ones. No matter where they live in this country, we'll be there. We stand strong, united. Stand with us in caring for our veterans. Hi, I'm Danica Patrick and proud aunt. Watching my nieces grow, play, and learn is amazing, but not every child gets to be carefree. One in six kids in the U.S. are hungry. One in six. That little girl sitting alone at the playground, she can't play like the other kids. She doesn't have the energy because she's hungry. School lunch will be her only meal today. It breaks my heart that this is the reality in our country, but it's something that Feeding America is working to change. Each year, the Feeding America network of food banks rescues billions of pounds of good food that would have gone to waste. This food is then provided to families and children in need. Being a kid should be about using your imagination, learning, and having fun. These children shouldn't have to miss out on simply being a kid because they're hungry. To find out how you can help end childhood hunger in your community, visit feedingamerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. This is Behind the Mic with Brad Dalius. Welcome back to Behind the Mic. Brad and Keith hanging out here from Kings Cove inside the Toyota Sports Center on this Thursday evening, talking a whole lot of NFL draft. The Patriots are currently picking now at 31. We talked about the AFC West, the NFC West, as far as the Chargers and Rams are concerned, how those teams are going to look coming up here in 2018 and beyond. We've also talked about the Oakland Raiders, Keith. Year one, obviously, for John Gruden coming up, back with this team, and they have a lot of different things they're trying to do. And now on the line with us, actually, is a former Oakland Raider, played in a Super Bowl. As we now welcome to the program, former Oakland Raiders wide receiver Jerry Porter. Jerry, thanks so much for coming on the program tonight. How you doing? I'm very well, sir. Thanks for having me. I apologize in advance for anything you hear in my background. You caught me at halftime of a flight <laughs> football game, but I had to take some time to get on the radio with you guys. 
Oh, it's all good. We appreciate the time. Uh, we know you're busy. It's a busy night in general for a lot of different people across the world of football. Right away, your former team, uh, they take an offensive tackle tonight uh, out of UCLA, trying to beef up the offensive line. As I, I mentioned before, year one, John Gruden, he's coming back, his second stint with the Raiders, trying to build this thing interior-wise outward. You know, I, and that's kind of been the trend here with a lot of different teams who've been successful recently in the National Football League. Uh, some of your thoughts right away on your former team and how they're looking here going into year one with John Gruden. Well, John Gruden is coming into a, a, a situation where the cupboard is nowhere near bare. Uh, he has a great, uh, a, a very good young quarterback. I don't want to call him great because great is thrown around too much. But he's a very good young quarterback, and the, the foundation is there for years to come. Uh, if he and, and John get along real well, there's no no limit to how far they can go. That's awesome. So, Jerry, let me ask you a question. You know, you're looking at their receiving core. I mean, arguably they had some of the, the best tandem receiving core last year. They're, they're very talented, and, you know, the, um, they really haven't got off on the best foot. But what do you think in terms of coming out next year, Omari Cooper? What should we expect from Omari Cooper next year uh, this upcoming season? Um, do you think he's going to be much better than what he was last year? Do you think what what does he have to do to get better and get into that elite level? I mean, you were with Tim Brown and Jerry Rice at time. You guys had a deadly set, a deadly <laughs> receiving core over there. What 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 do they have to do to get to that level? Well, to, I don't know that you could ever get to that level with two Hall of Famers. Yeah, uh, with Tim and Jerry. They were both just like great presences to learn from and be around as all the, all the professional um, the professional manner in which they both went about their business. But with Jordy Nelson coming over, and as I, I see they trade made a trade for Martavius Bryant, that team with that offense, I mean, with John Gruden's offense, with Derek Carr, uh, Amari Cooper, Jordy Nelson, Martavius Bryant, and whoever else they choose to bring into the fold, um, it, it could be deadly. Um, this is a pass happy league, and we're throwing it pretty much uh, 70 30. Uh, they have a beast mode in the backfield and a bruising O line that they're just trying to revamp. I think I, I don't want to be one of those people that say, oh, Super Bowl right now, but providing no injuries and the guys play hard all the time, it shouldn't be any problem at all. Are you excited about the direction that the team is going in? Jerry, are you a fan of uh, John Gruden coming back here and uh, just really seeing this team in their last couple of years in Oakland, obviously, before they go to Las Vegas, the big move in just a couple of years? Are you a fan of the direction that they're going and trying to get back, obviously, to not only winning ways, but championship type of football? I see. I mean, I don't again, I don't want to be one of those people that say it's Super Bowl right now, but everything is in place. Yeah. I, you got to shore, shore up the defense. Um, you got Khalil Mack over there. He's a force, but and in, in terms of um, uh, going forward, like you get you get him, you got to lock him up because that's going to be a, uh, something hanging over your head. You don't want him to have to think about his contract going into this year. If you get him locked up, you can get other people locked up and save yourself some some space. The team will be in absolute great shape going into Vegas. And, and with the new, their pick, they picked up Colton Miller from UCLA. Is this a great addition to have when you have people like Donald Penn, who's also a left tackle, you have big players like that? Is this the? Do you think that was the best move that they made in this draft? Do you think that that was the the right move in terms of going with the old, with the offensive lineman? Well. I don't. I can't say that it's a good or bad move because I don't watch O line, and that's the boring part of the game to watch to see how a, a the big guy controls somebody else um, and run run block. I'm not looking at the uh, the run block or the pass block. I'm looking at the outcome of it. But uh, I trust the uh, the GM and uh, the head coach, everybody upstairs who's making these decisions. They wouldn't just uh, close their eyes and blindly pick a guy. If they picked him in the first round, they, they expect him to do well and. I have faith in the uh, the upper management of the Raiders that they're going to make the right decision. We're talking with the one and only Jerry Porter, former Oakland Raiders receiver here on Behind the Mic. You know, about 18 years ago, Jerry, you were selected out of a, a college called West Virginia. Back in the 2000 draft, you were selected in the second round 
uh, by the Oakland Raiders. What was draft day like for you back in 2000? Uh, take us through that day if you can remember. What were some of the emotions that <laughs> were going through your like mind? I remember it was yesterday. I'm sorry for cutting you off, but I remember like it was yesterday because <laughs> that was back when you had um, – the first, uh, the first, second, and third round on one day on the Saturday, and uh, Sunday you have four, five, six, and seven. And I didn't uh, have the greatest stats or the most time on offense, but I expected to be a first round pick. So I'm not going to lie. On the draft day, I was pretty perturbed to be a second round pick because I didn't think any receiver that was taken ahead of me was actually better than me. But it ended up me going to the best situation for me because I got a chance to learn from Andre Risen, Tim Brown, Jerry Rice, David Dunn. Uh, Horace Copeland for a hot second. I mean, I had some of the best people in the game uh, to learn from. And, and Jerry, you know, and you, the night before that, what kind of things are going through your mind as like as the the draft comes? Like these guys, what type of pressure are they feeling when they when they when they're actually getting drafted, or is there pressure in that? Did you feel any pressure on yourself? It was just like wow, like it's just a life changing experience. Experience. Uh, did you feel any type of pressure at all going to, going into the draft? To be honest, the draft itself, I, had, I, I did, the work was done already. I didn't have to. I didn't feel any pressure. I just knew that when I got there, I had to earn my spot, and that's what I was told from day one. Uh, all the guys, uh, um, sorry, all the guys around me is like, hey, Rook, you, uh, you could either do this for one or two years, or you could do it, make a career out of it. And uh, it's all, you say, they basically said it's all about your approach. So if you take it, you take it lightly, it'll be a one or two year thing. If you make it a career, you can make a great career out of it. And I kind of tried to take those words to heart and uh, work on my craft. And each year, I feel like I got better. Do any of these players, Jerry, remind you of yourself? Any of the receivers that have been selected tonight or are still on the board? Do you see yourself in any of these guys when you were their age? Uh, again, I can't say for sure because I don't watch enough tape to, to make a, an assumption like that. But um, the, bigger, the bigger receiver now is kind of like uh, in style. Whereas back when I was getting drafted, everybody had – they already had the – the 5'10", 200-pound guy, 195-pound guy that could run routes and get loose. And then the evolution of the game was Randy Moss taking the top off and other big, tall receivers that can run uh, coming out, um, being kind of like the, the new fad. It's kind of like the big receivers uh, here to stay now. So uh, with, with that being said, I hear about the kid from SMU. Uh, I haven't seen much tape on him, but uh, uh, height, weight, uh, speed, uh, he sounds like somebody who's uh, uh, very similar to, to myself coming out. What's your best advice for some of these guys? Uh, my best advice, while it may be a game, it's still a job. And if you don't come to work every day, you will be unemployed. Wow. Well put. <laughs> that is well, well put. put. Once again, Jerry Porter joining us here on Behind the Mic. Hey, Jerry, we appreciate the time tonight. Uh, we will let you get back to uh, all your activities uh, that you're currently uh, being occupied with. But we appreciate the insights and all the best to you moving forward as well as you try and break into the broadcasting world. You know, I mean, if you guys have a space for me, I got, I got a lot of football knowledge I'd like to uh, give to the people. But uh, I don't want to take anybody's job. I'm going to earn it. <laughs> no, no, absolutely. You're always welcome on this show, Jerry. You're always a friend of the program. <laughs> hey, Jerry. Yeah, I appreciate that. Jerry, take care, man. Don't do not do them too bad out there, man. Take it easy on them. <laughs> uh, we're, 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 we're only up by like four or five touchdowns, but that's okay. <laughs> All right, man. Take care. <laughs> take care. There he goes once again, Jerry Porter, joining us here on Behind the Mic, giving his insights, former Oakland Raiders receiver, played in the Super Bowl, Keith, great career. Wow, he learned from some of the best, too, Yeah. at that point in time, in the early 2000s, with Jerry Rice coming into towards the end of his career. Man, oh, man. Great, great, uh, great receiving core they had there in Oakland, and they're trying to get back to those ways, obviously. Yeah, they absolutely are, and uh, I mean, he, he he did make a, a a great point. Is you know, this is a job, so you know, come ready, come ready to play. You know, you this is not once you get here. The, getting here is the easy part. Keeping your job is the hard part, and so you know, the NFL you got to have a big respect for it. You know, it's a huge respect. So you know, I, I'm glad, I'm glad that uh, that you know, 
that he came and had some insight on it. And these guys, you know, I wish them all the nothing but the best. You know, this is great for them to see what they've been doing. And um, so we'll see what, what happens next. We, I was looking up here. Lamar Jackson went over to the court to the Baltimore Ravens. I believe I said that. I said he. I said Lamar Jackson could go to the Ravens. Back up behind Joe Flacco, and that's what happened. And it's something something else that look what you see here. Bill Belichick has has really had people going. It picked up Sony uh, Sony Mitchell or Michael yeah, Michael Michelle, Michelle actually I believe Sony, Sony Michelle. Michelle yeah that's a nice pick yeah. he was phenomenal in the playoffs yeah he especially was. in the Rose Bowl against Oklahoma he ran all over that Sooners defense that's a great pickup especially losing Dion Lewis to free agency they yeah. filled a filled a gap there and Jeremy Hill coming over there from uh, Cincinnati Bengals seemingly they never have a problem with running back yeah and you know what I mean they're always able to plug and play guys all the time but again it makes me wonder, like, what's going on with the, with the our backup quarterback? I mean, you're going. To, I guess it's what they say. Tom Brady. They said it was a report that went out a while ago. Said Tom Brady was just in vibe with Jimmy Garoppolo in terms of, you know, the age was a big difference between the two, so they really couldn't relate. And they brought in Brian Hoyer, but I don't even think that's an. I just think that maybe. Them not getting a backup quarterback really, quite I really question that. Like maybe they, I don't know. Maybe they'll pick one up in the second round. There's still one on the board left, right? That we know about. And Definitely Mason Rudolph, and yeah. you've also got uh, Kenny Hill, the yeah. quarterback from TCU. Uh-huh. So, I mean, so there's a couple guys out there. I'm surprised, but I'm not surprised as well, yeah, well because yeah. at, at the end of the day. They're going to do what Kraft wants to do, obviously, ultimately, as the owner. Yeah. And we know he's in Brady's corner, yeah. at least more so than Belichick is, if you believe a lot of these different reports, i.e. the ESPN report and others, that the brady Kraft relationship is a lot stronger than the Brady-Belichick relationship at this point in time. So if you buy into that one, it makes sense. Kraft is in full believement that Brady can play until he's, uh, he's 45. Yeah. And Brady has not waned from that. Now, I think this offseason, for the first time in his career, he's actually has started to entertain the idea of retirement, but he, he's nowhere near making that official decision yet. Or I don't think he's anywhere. He's exploring the idea. He's kicking the tires around. I think he, Stu, has uh, all the expectations of the world in himself that he's going to play for a couple more years, though, still. Yeah. And they're not – They, I guess Belichick at this point, if that is the case and if he knows that – he, he looks at it that he's not going to waste the pick on a quarterback. That's true. When they can just get guys to plug and play, like I've been saying, all night long, and they can continue to put the best team on the field to win here in 2019, or yeah, 2018, 2019, and uh, beyond for the next couple of years until Brady actually hangs them up finally. Yeah, That's interesting. Well, yeah, I guess you're, you're absolutely right. I guess you can't play to say, hopefully, that, oh, if your player gets hurt or anything like that. You know, I think you you're suspecting he's going to be there the whole the whole time. So yeah, he did I, a smart move by beefing up his line. Absolutely, and uh, keeping and that just you know let's let's be let's be quite frank. The reason Brady's able to play as long as he had because he doesn't take as many hits for many of reasons. And the I'll say this: ninety percent of it they say is because he releases the ball fast. So I'm gonna say no. I'm gonna say this: eighty percent of it is the simple fact that his offensive linemen have protected him so well throughout his whole career that he really hasn't really had that many hits at him is what people think they are, you know. And so that's been, you know, that's been the main, I think, the main reason. Now, on the flip side, I mean, Jerry gave us some little news right away. And Martavius Bryant going over to the Oakland Raiders with Amari Cooper. I mean, that now is a team to be reckoned with. Again, but you know what's interesting? On paper, like we had said this before, on paper they should have been the number one. They should have been number two or number one in AFC. They should have. And maybe John Gruden can get them over the hump. So, you know, you see that for a third-round pick, though, like who's the winner in this stake? You have to go with – you have to go with with the uh, 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 Oakland Raiders, you know, so – You do. I don't know. I don't know about this one in terms of 
I think the Oakland Raiders got it got it right, and the Pittsburgh Steelers just. I think it's falling down further down the line now. It's almost a case that Pittsburgh doesn't know what to do with all the talent they have sometimes. Yes. Right? They don't have the right coaching staff for that. They have a coaching staff that sometimes can put their foot in their mouth too many times. And, and they just don't have a very disciplined franchise there at the moment, which, uh, you know, guys like Chuck Knoll and Bill Cower have just got, just got to drive them nuts yeah. because they have been over the years a lot like that. But for whatever reason, in recent years, since Antonio Brown's been there and others, Le'Veon Bell, he's a drama queen as well, as we all know, they have not been a disciplined football team, and they just can't handle all this talent. I've been saying it now for the last couple of years. They had the most talented team on paper yeah. in the entire league, yeah. but they can't put it together. And but, this is the result sometimes of that, Keith. They trade players away. But you know what? Let's, 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 let's go back here a little bit. Mm-hmm. you got to remember something. Martavius Bryant had issues with with the team because he wasn't getting the ball enough from Ben Roethlisberger and Juju Schuster. Remember, Martavius Martavius Bryant was suspended. Remember, he was suspended. Juju Schuster came in, Smith came in, and he started killing it. And he's become he's gotten a lot of chemistry between the team and the player. And then Martavius came out and said that I'm clearly the better receiver, and they should be playing. I should be playing more after he came off his suspension, and then. He kind of was, you know, that was a distraction for a while. And Juju never really said anything else, you know, recant or anything about it. He was just like, I'm playing to win, help the team. And the Golden Knights score again. And um, and and basically, I'm just, what I'm getting at is Martavis was an issue towards the end of the season. So they go ahead and they go with Juju, Suster, Juju Smith-Suster and as their clear-cut number two. Which I think, in a way, I'm like, hey, he, he is a great number two. Juju Smith was great at USC. He's been great for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Um, and, you know, yes, you got a, a lot of talent. If, if Martavis, I think if Martavis just went ahead and stick with the program, they were in a great arsenal because even towards the end of the season, he kept his mouth shut and he started getting the ball a little bit more. You start seeing that talented. And they were great as a uh, one, two, three punch that they had. And uh, by him leaving, you know, it just it just says like, yeah, you know, we we don't want you to be that distraction. Maybe we'll go somewhere else better. So, and to you your point, they have so much talent there in offense; they can almost afford to do something like this. You mentioned Smith Schuster. Don't forget they have Eli Rogers as well. We yeah. all know about Antonio Brown. They're just loaded. Jesse James. Yes. There's so much, so much talent there. If if any of these seasons come around here sometime soon, if they can somehow put it together. Yeah. They're going to be a team that is going to be an extremely hard out. But it remains to be seen if they can ever be that fundamentally sound football team that's disciplined the way you need to be to win in this league at a big-time level. I want to touch on uh, the LeBron James situation, the goaltending call that was not called last night. We saw the game we were at over at Grunion's. We saw the game-winning three by LeBron to knock off Indiana and uh, put the Cavs up three games to two. But we didn't see live, at least, and what we both saw after the show last night was uh, what was clearly a goaltending uh, against LeBron. Uh, Oladipo, this is right before the three. Oladipo goes up, tries to to get an easy bucket from point blank range with the layup. It goes off uh, the backboard and the glass. LeBron touches it. The refs don't call it. They call it a block. And what happens today, the league comes out and the NBA, and they say that, yeah, we messed up. We messed up. Oh, by the way, though, we couldn't have reviewed it even if we wanted to last night because on the court, it was called a block and not a goal test. That, that is to me. Give me a break. break. That's so, to me, that's so much BS. And it's messed up because players that get to this point, it, it, it goes back to this. I'll be honest. I, I, I'm a LeBron James. I love LeBron James' game. I love what he stands for now. But it's moves that what I don't like about LeBron James situations is this. I, I'll go back to this. I'll go back to two years ago when LeBron James, his whole legacy was on the line, and he so-called got kicked in the in the private area by Draymond Green. He complains about it in the press conference and says, "And says LeBron Draymond Green should be suspended." And that was a very controversial call. On top of that, it was. And what did they do? They suspend Draymond Green, which they shouldn't have done. They lose game five. They lose game six, which they would have would have won. And and they 
you know, Cleveland goes on and wins the championship by a miracle. One last shot by Kyrie Irving, who's yeah. no longer with them. The rest and, that, and, and, and that game would not have – that game have not won that way if he had gotten into it. Then you get calls like this. Then you get stuff like, here you go again. It's another situation where – LeBron James is on the brink of getting eliminated in the first round. And here you go with Oladipo goes for a shot. They block, they call it, which clearly should have been a goaltending call. I mean, everybody saw the replay. And then the NBA comes out afterwards, and then LeBron James hits a three. Now, look, LeBron James hit a three anyway. Scores, boom, the game's over. Great shot by LeBron, right? But I totally agree with Victor Oladipo. Maybe that game that that sh- that would have been uh, that play would have been wouldn't have been called. Maybe something completely different would have happened in that situation. But you know what? When you rip players off like that, it makes you feel like yo is the NBA ended for just LeBron James and then for the <laughs> money? It's for money like he's going to generate more money and people going to watch and use the game more if he's in the playoffs because that's what it seems like. And it's so messed up because you got these guys who play out the whole entire season, and they sit here and they get screwed off a game. Here you got a game seven that you're going to go to game six, and and, and Indiana on the brink of getting eliminated because of a call that really could have just was a deciding factor in a game. You know, instant replays. Look, when the last thing that happened before when they had called that play on. Uh, on uh, Lance Stevenson and um, that was on Lance Stevenson LeBron. and LeBron. What happened there? They called. They they said no. Lance Stevenson and uh, uh, Green and Green on the tie up, and they said that they ruled it that oh he was a jump. One called it a jump ball. One called it a foul. Now you go and instantly what happens as soon as that was over on TNT? What they do? The head ref comes out and says something in New York. And said, "No, we what's ruled is a a jump uh, a foul overrules a jump ball. Like I've never heard of that in my life. Number one, and number two is that why never why didn't New York has to do a better job? The, the head referees in New York need to say something if they feel a certain type of way. They shouldn't let that just ride. You got basically five eyes." Of uh, officials that do, you got three on the, you got uh, four, three on the four, and then two in New York that are watching. Like, you mean to tell me you guys after the whole thing's over now you say something? That's a bunch of BS, man. Is twenty eighteen? This is not nineteen eighteen. The crazy thing is that the broadcasters on the telecast can see the replay; they can see it, but. Since we're going off of human judgment, and that's the deciding factor for a lot of different things here, since it was called a block on LeBron and not a goal tent last night, specifying that specific play, they can't go to the replay. It's unreal. It just it drives me crazy, Keith. We have the technology to do it, but they're not doing it. No. You've got to be kidding me how you can't go to that replay monitor to fix to get the call right. In the playoffs, no doubt. Exactly. When we have more eyeballs on these games and at any other time during the whole entire season. You've got to get it right. And I'm not asking for these guys to be perfect. They're not. But when we have a perfect replay system, the tape doesn't lie, as we've heard that expression many times before, you've got to get it right. It's embarrassing for the league. I feel bad for Victor Oladipo. Again, like you said, LeBron hits the three. Yeah, but going back to your point and Oladipo's point, you just don't know. It could change the whole complexion of the play that they're going to run at that point. Maybe Ty Lue draws up a totally different play for Cleveland. We just don't know. That's why you got to play these things out. But again, for us not to get replay correct in 2018 is astonishing. Mm -hmm. It is astonishing. And one of these days... We're going to have something that really gets messed up, whether it be in an NBA Finals game, World Series Game 7, in the championship round. There's going to be a call that comes that's going to be controversial, and it's not going to be a good look because they have not been able to come up with a solution to this yet. Yeah. And, and it's an easy solution. Make every play reviewable. Yeah. Absolutely. And I don't want to hear about, oh, it's going to take too long, it's going to take time out of the game. People are there. They're paying to see the game. Yeah. They're not going to mind. People on TV... They're locked into it anyhow. Yeah, it's they've not, already they've already got their market of yeah, sports fans gonna, watching the game. It's games. not going to slow it's down the game. That is just astonishing to me that we are still talking about this and it has not been resolved yet. Uh, to uh, for what should be something simple, got to change. Yeah. Got to change up. 
final thoughts tonight, Keith, as we wrap up uh, this week's shows and uh, tonight's program here at Kings Cove? You know, I, I was... I read something yesterday. I think I talked to you off the air about it, and I saw it again today. today and it really bothered me. You know, I have to go to the ball, bro, the bra, the ball brothers, Lavar Ball. You know, Lavar in the family. Lavar Ball, Lavar Ball did it again. Lavar Ball took his kids to Lamelo. Let's see a little backstory. Basically, Leangelo got in trouble at UCLA. Leangelo leaves UCLA because his father felt that his punishment was a little bit severe. Uh, stealing in a foreign country, you know, we can know about that whole thing. Anyway, they go. He goes to Lithuania. Uh, Lamelo gets taken out of Chino Hills. Lamelo's old high school team wins a state championship when he wasn't there. He goes to Chino Hills and plays in Lithuania. They think Lavar thinks that's the best move for him. Well, Lavar goes at it again with the coach over there in Lithuania. Lithuania's coach has something to say about it. And then what bothers me is a, co- a player. A, co- uh, a, f- a father who's living his basketball dreams in his kids' eye, uh, through his kids, and them not be able to experience the game on a fun, just on a fun level, but also not getting that fair shot the way Lonzo did. Lonzo got the fair shot. He got a chance to go to high school, finish out his high school re- career, and then go to college. Lamelo, the younger one, didn't able to do that. What happens? They leave Lithuania early. They go home, and the father has a falling out with the coach over there because he one thinks he's the best coach ever. Lavar thinks he's the best coach. He can make the ultimate decisions, and and there you go. His kids now have his dad has now burned a bri- another bridge. You burn one in Chino Hills in high school. You burn one to UCLA. You burn another bridge over here with the Lakers by your talks and you saying stuff. And now you burn one in Lithuania. No one's going to want this kid. Lamelo is not going to get a fair shot. And it's, I'm sorry to say it, it's a shame. He doesn't. He hasn't finished high school. He's not going to even finish his high school education because he's not getting homeschooled. Because it was reported that he wasn't doing homeschool. He was just strictly playing basketball. Now a kid's not even going to even get his diploma, which is sad to say. So I look at it as like, you know, it's just sad. Parents. When you got kids that are playing ball and doing good things and playing well, just let them play. Let let the chips fall where they fall. Don't try to be their agent or anything. Be their parent. Just be there and support. And this is a prime example of what he did, as LeVar Ball did, is messed up his two sons' basketball career because LeAngelo Ball is not getting drafted to the Los Angeles Lakers, so to say. So that's my comment point. Hey, earlier this week, ESPN aired one of those uh, short Sports Center feature uh, films. We've all seen those before. This one, Tom Rinaldi reported on, as he's done many times before. It's about a golfer in the country of Nepal, not too far from Mount Everest, actually. There's a golf course there, I believe it's called uh, Royal Nepal. And uh, this girl grew up on the golf course, actually. She grew up with her two parents. They lived in a shed just off of one of the holes on the golf course. Uh, Obviously, a very, very difficult uh, type of living situation. Nothing at all like we're accustomed to here in the United States. She grew up there. She's now 18. And she started playing golf every day on the course. They lived in the course. Her parents worked there. She started hitting golf balls off the range on a daily basis. Got really good started entering a lot of different competitions and uh, not too long ago she entered into a competition to try and get her uh, professional card to play uh, professionally uh, here in the United States unfortunately she didn't score well enough to get to that card to become professional but she's continuing uh, to improve her game however Tiger Woods got wind of this story and while she actually made a trip here recently to the United States, she got a chance to meet Tiger and get somewhat of a private lesson That's from awesome. the all-time great. Awesome. So a really, really good story. You can check it out on ESPN, uh, a short little film there, as they do a lot of times. Um, really good one. Very inspiring story. I'm thinking we're going to hear about her probably on the LPGA Tour at some point uh, down the line. Uh, very talented golfer and a bright future ahead of her, but a really, really good story, and um, it's looking like it's having a good ending here as well. So uh, that caught my eye this week, uh, a good presentation there from ESPN. And uh, Tom Rinaldi, he's always got uh, the pulse on that stuff. I'm telling you, he does a million things for them, 
and uh, a lot of different reporting. So uh, that was a very fascinating story and very uplifting uh, awesome. to a lot of different people. So that's what we got here in the world of sports. Great week. Um, great night. Great NFL draft. Uh, night number one for round one of this 2018 draft down there in Dallas. We talked about so many different teams hitting on a lot of needs, a lot of defensive guys taking, a lot of offensive guards and tackles as well. AFC West is getting bolstered up. Uh, no Rams picks tonight. Of course, they don't pick until round three, so they're kind of just sitting back and enjoying the ride here a bit until they go to work and uh, they decide to pick their guy out and select who they're going to take uh, to begin uh, their 2018 season. So, again, great show tonight. For Keith, I'm Brad. Big thanks to Jerry Porter for calling in tonight as well. We appreciated his time. Keep living the dream. We'll talk to you next week.